Hello, and welcome to the Poultry Science Association's annual, or I'm sorry, webinar series. Um, we're excited to have you join us. I'm Doug Britton. I'm a member of the board for the Poultry Science Association. Um, but before we get started, I'd like to run through a few helpful tips for navigating the webinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the PSA website about 24 hours after the conclusion of the webinar. If you have a question, we'd ask that you please type that in the Q&A um, panel at the bottom of the screen. Please don't use the raise hand icon as we won't be able to unmute and mute um, speakers and, and participants in this webinar. There will be time at the end of the webinar for some Q&A. So please go ahead and use that Q&A tab as your opportunity to ask those questions. Um, the subtitles are enabled on this webinar. If you'd prefer not to have subtitles on the screen, you can disable those um, at the bottom of your screen by clicking on the live transcript icon and then also hide subtitles. So without further ado, it's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker. He's a good friend of mine and a colleague here at Georgia Tech, Colin Usher. Colin is a senior research scientist and the interim branch head of the robotic systems and technologies branch at the Georgia Tech Research Institute, where he has served as the technical lead and a project manager over a 20 year career and been a significant contributor to the agricultural technology research program here at Georgia Tech. He's managed several multidisciplinary teams in the development and evaluation of industrial automation prototype systems for a multitude of clients ranging from food and agriculture companies to government sponsors such as the Department of Transportation and um, the poultry industry. His technical expertise is in machine vision, robotics, systems integration, and embedded systems development. Most recently, his work has focused on the intersection of virtual and extended reality systems and robotics. Um, the title of Colin's presentation today is Using Virtual Reality to enable robotics and automation in poultry processing. So Colin, thank you for being on and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Doug. Um, I, I realize as I have this here, I should have had a slide that says a little bit about, uh, about our organization here, but for those of you who may not know us, um, uh, we are the applied research arm of Georgia Tech. So Georgia Tech Research Institute does uh, a, a vast array of research and development and a lot of rapid prototype systems um, in uh, uh, quite a, a large capacity. And uh, we sit over on the corner of campus and uh, focus on agricultural systems. And uh, a lot of our work focuses primarily in poultry due to the uh, Georgia economy be dri being driven largely by poultry processing and farming in the state of Georgia. <clears throat> we have a program called the Agricultural Technology Research Program that's run by the state and supported by the poultry industry that enables a lot of the research that you get to see here. And I always enjoy uh, talking to the uh, at, at Poultry Science Association events because I, I get to come in and talk about some uh, some of the neat research that we're doing that's a little outside of the box and maybe a little different from some of the things that you might uh, might uh, hear at your regular uh, seminar or uh, or conference. <clears throat> and uh, without further ado, we'll uh, go ahead and get started here. And uh, I am <clears throat> just to give a, a brief outline of what I'll be talking about here today. I am going to talk a little bit about some of the um, uh, just a, 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 an introduction of, of robotics in poultry processing and some of the challenges that are there. Why is it so difficult in poultry processing? I'll then highlight a little bit of the state of the art research that we have done, um, some of the previous projects we have done, and more standard robotics uh, applications in poultry processing. And then I will talk a little bit more about which is which is um, my particular focus is how we're leveraging some of the newest technology and virtual reality systems to try and bridge the gap to address some of these challenges that we see in robotics applications, particularly in in poultry processing. Right, so uh, um, you can see here in the in the upper a uh, portion of the slide, just a picture of some of the robotics processing applications that are actually in, in lamb and, and beef, which is uh, um, uh, fairly more automated in a sense with robotics than poultry processing. And down in the, the bottom, it's a little, uh, a little silly uh, imaging, reimagining of what a processing line might look like with a bunch of robots working on it. <clears throat> um, but we like to think ourselves here as food production 
is manufacturing, right? In a lot of cases, and there's a lot of focus with funding and government um, government funding that looks at manufacturing processes, but they they don't really look at food processing uh, as part of that um, as part of that. Uh, process. And we like to think of that a little differently. Um, we do think of food production and food processing as a, as a very, very much a manufacturing process. Um, what is the big difference? Well, we're doing disassembly instead of assembly, right? When uh, a standard manufacturing part, you might have a lot of parts come in and you put together and you, you build a car. Uh, on us, we're doing the opposite, right? We get uh, a full chicken in and we take it apart and make several different products out of it. Um, but if you really think about it in the type of equipment and processes that go on, it is very much a manufacturing process. Uh, but what makes it challenging versus, say, building a car or welding, uh, welding rivets on an airplane wing? Well, the biggest challenge, obviously, is that every product that comes in food processing is unique. Uh, not only is it unique, but it's also malleable and deformable. It can be slippery or wet, right? It can be messy. Um, and the environments that you're working in are typically pretty harsh environments. They either need to be uh, they need to be chilled down to 40 degrees in a lot of the rooms that you're working in, and they're just uh, they're they're not the same as a standard manufacturing environment where you have nice air conditioned and controlled environments. This makes it uh, obviously challenging for automation. And here you can see a video of uh, of a of a footballer machine that is uh, cutting the legs and front half off of a chicken that has had the wings removed in preparation for running into an automated deboning station. So I'll, I'll spend just a minute talking about why, why does standard uh, robot, why do standard robot systems fail, particularly in poultry, or why do we not see more automation in that sense? Uh, before I talk about that, I'll mention briefly, if you do typically see robots in poultry processes or poultry processing plants, they're doing operations like case packing or uh, uh, maybe they're placing the meat into a tray or they're wrapping the tray or they're palletizing already case packed stuff. That's a very standard robotics application, typically at the very end of the process um, where it's a much more controlled environment. <clears throat> so why do you not see more of these robots working say on the processing line doing deboning or cut up or uh, more advanced operation? And some of those challenges that, I like, that I'd like to talk about here in particular are uh, poultry processing is a high throughput operation, right? So you have up to 180 birds or more a minute running through these systems being processed. Um, one of the challenges when you have a robot system that can manipulate something is that you have to have image processing systems and software algorithms that are able to make decisions for that robot to do the control. And a lot of the state of the art systems will get you up to around 90, sometimes maybe 95% efficiency. Um, meaning that they're, they're accurate 95% of the time, but if you think about it 180 birds a minute, right, or if you look at my, my sample here at 90%, right, that's 18 birds a minute that you are failing this operation with. And that's something that's just not acceptable when you're talking about getting automated systems in these processing uh, locations. Uh, another challenge is manipulating the product. Right. As you uh, look at end defectors and how do you pick up that product, as I mentioned, it's malleable and it's slippery um, to use the scientific term. Right. There's a low friction coefficient for these product. So it's challenging just to grip them and manipulate them in a fashion that you want, particularly if you're trying to do cuts and other types of operations on these products. So as we look to the future, <clears throat> we like to think of robotics and application and processing as a as a case of manufacturing on a lot of one right and what that means is we know each product is unique so we want to uniquely process each of those products right and that requires adaptive systems that requires um non-fixed automation as we uh as you typically see with case packing and things we like to call that fixed automation um, and that doesn't really work when you talk about a lot of one Right? And that means that sensing and decision making is paramount in these systems. Right? How do we identify that, that product and remove the background so we can localize it and characterize it? How do we measure it accurately? And then how do we make those decisions so that we can then control the end effectors or the robots to do the actions that we want it to do? These are all the, the different types of challenges that, that have to come together to create a successful system. Uh, and here is just a video of a typical chicken plant 
this is where you can see in this case um, you have chickens that are getting piled up in bins and you can imagine the, uh, and you could also see the high speed nature of this process, right? The people are hanging these chickens. Um, they are picking them up from a bin and it's, you can see the challenge for sensing systems and cameras. You can imagine as you, as you look at this area <clears throat> and look at the process that's going on. You'll also notice that the person is using both of their hands. They're picking up the bird and they're doing a relatively complex task, something that's very simple for humans, but is very challenging for a robot to do. And then we talk about the speed and the throughput once again. <clears throat> Here I threw this video in just to show another sample of, uh, of the uh, of a cone loading operation, but here the, the chickens are coming in in a bin once again. But I really wanted to highlight here just some of the advances in sensor technology that you will actually see later in this presentation that we're utilizing with some of the virtual reality systems work that we're doing. But this is a 3D sensor that doesn't give you just, uh, it's not just a video in a 2D video, it actually contains the depth data. So we can see the operation in 3D. That gives us additional information that we can then use to do sensing and develop algorithms for having robotic systems manipulate or handle these particular applications. Um, using some of those types of sensors here, you can see, uh, uh, I, I wanted to highlight an example of some research that we have done in the past, where we looked at trying to do a sensing approach for identifying points on a chicken to pick up um, in bin picking of batch product. And this was looking once again at cone loading, but you can imagine this is similar for um, shackle and hang and applications like that. In the top right, you see an image of, a, this is a live bird that we actually captured in a field as it was being weighed in a weighing system, but you can see the fidelity of the 3D sensing system that we used. Um, just, to, just to briefly mention the sensors that we're using for these, these are a Microsoft Connect. So these are actually a video game developed sensor on the consumer market that uh, is a very low cost. So about $150 to, to $300 for these sensors on what, you know, five and seven years ago, that same sensing technology would have cost uh, tens of thousands of dollars. <clears throat> Um, here are some standard images that show some of the uh, image processing techniques that are typically used when you're doing product identification or looking for features to, to extract to automate systems with robotics. The picture in the top left is just the, the raw image captured from a camera. And the picture in the middle and the bottom right are two filters that are passed for trying to identify features and edges. As you look at it as a human, you might notice that you see the shape of several chicken breasts in different parts of the chicken. And it, what looks very uh, clear to a human is very challenging in a lot of cases to teach a robot or develop an algorithm to do, particularly given the you know, almost infinite variety of, of combinations that you might see as chickens just randomly get piled into a bin. Here is some work we did several years ago with some image processing and depth data fusion, where we were looking to identify uh, the wings of the chickens for grasping with, uh, with a robot end effector. You can see here the red and the blue highlighted areas in this video show areas where an algorithm thought there were possibly wings or grasping areas of birds. And then the red ones are ones of highest confidence. And then the circle indicates the one that is the highest of because of the depth data, which is something that we might ask a robot to go and grasp. Now, what you might notice is the chicken wing at the top, that that entire body of the chicken is more exposed. So if it, it, it may have been more desirable for the robot to pick that top chicken than the bottom one. The bottom one you can see is a, you see the wing clearly, but it may be buried under some of the uh, other chickens. Therefore, an, in, an a robot going to pick that wing may fail as it tries to pull that bird out of being buried from other birds, right? These are decisions that humans can make very quickly and easily. But when we look at robot systems and automated systems, this might be a, a point of failure when you think about that, that type of application. Um, here we uh, highlight some of the end effector work that we've done, as I mentioned, the manipulation and handling. I also show this because you'll see a little bit of this come back up again when I talk about the virtual reality work that we're doing here. And uh, you know, handling that product, even though you can sense it and detect it, 
that doesn't mean you can pick it up and manipulate it and move it around for the, the same reasons I pointed out earlier, right? The, the slipperiness, the malleableness, and, and the different shapes and sizes of that, of that product. So we have done quite a bit of work looking at different, different types of grippers and different types of, uh, of manipulators for handling different product and moving them around. Um, everything from suctions, using suction to soft grippers and even biologically inspired as I, I like sharing the uh, nightmare inducing lamprey fish in the bottom left there as we think about how might you grasp and pick up uh, different types of products, <clears throat> uh, particularly, uh, uh, particularly organic products. The top right, you see a very simple suction cup, uh, suction based end effector that you're going to see that we use later. And sometimes it's the simpler designs that work more robustly, um, which, uh, which is uh, the solution that you migrate towards. And you'll see us using this suction cup end effector for handling several, diff several different types of poultry product as we're moving them around. Um, <clears throat> Now that I gave just a little bit of a, a overview of some of the different areas that we worked in, I did want to highlight one of the uh, more classical automation projects that we have spent several years developing and we've had very good success with this system. Um, and I just wanted to highlight how a lot of those technologies you saw and a lot of the research you saw earlier comes together. And, and what you might see in a more advanced processing system now. And this is the intelligent cutting project that we have done. This is a, you can think of this is almost a holy grail project of automation. And there are lots of different uh, solutions out there for doing automated deboning. Most of them are very mechanically tuned and they, they handle that product on a bell curve. Once again, we, we wanna look at these on that lot of one. So every product is individually characterized and processed. Right. So the goal in this project was to develop a machine vision based robot that can perform cuts and chickens that rival those of humans. It uses 3D sensors like you saw in some sample video earlier, um, a, uh, some patented algorithms that we have, and then it uh, it, it mimics the dynamics of a human when you talk about the, the actual cutting trajectories and the poses and orientations of that knife as it's doing the cut, all while using force feedback. So we, we, we did a lot of work looking at what people did and characterizing how people do these cuts and looking at the forces and the directions and how they treated each chicken different. So we could try to leverage how that occurs to then implement that with a robot and do those same types of cuts. Here you see some data that was captured of both IMU and force torque data, as well as positional and motion data it was captured from video streams that you see here with this, um, this big blocky knife in the uh, right hand side and these images that were taken here. <clears throat> Com combining the image processing and those dynamics for the cut, um, you can see here was a, a field trial that was run using that system on a moving line performing the shoulder cuts. So this is cutting through the uh, shoulder bone and down the back of the system. Um, this has been a, a very successful research project for us. It's one that is that is still ongoing as we look at improving it. But I wanted to highlight a more, uh, um, I would say, a more traditional research project for us before we talk about some of the VR work because it actually was um, that this a lot of this work is what led directly into um, leveraging these VR systems that we are today to try and address some of the challenges that we see here. And so with that, I'll pivot a little bit to talk very specifically now about the virtual reality work that we are doing. As I mentioned before, poultry processing is hard. All of those different limitations that we have, but this is, this is talking not just from the functional standpoint of getting a robot to do it, but also to have a person doing that task, right? People are the best implement are the best implements for doing these tasks right now, but they're working in harsh environments. It's cold, it's humid, their tasks are repetitive, and it is dangerous, right? They're working with sharp implements all the time. They're doing cutting, they're doing deboning. Um, they're working around dangerous equipment uh, that, that, can, that can hurt them if it is not used correctly. And then that, that all goes to say, you know, there are chronic labor shortages in these industries, right? There's high turnover. It's hard to train people or keep them in these areas because the environments are not attractive and, and the work is not attractive as well. Right. So we have been looking, as you look at the, uh, the illustration here, right? can we take these manual operations that people are doing 
can we allow robots to do these app applications? However, where the robots fail in that sensing and decision making, can we use humans in virtual reality systems to give the information to those robots to turn it into a semi-automated process? And when we talk about virtual reality systems, I wanted to share just a, a, a handful of slides, um, well, one slide, <laughs> about uh, the state of technology today as we see it. And there are more and more virtual reality headsets that are coming out, both at the consumer and enterprise level. And they have very high accuracy tracking capability. They create immersive environments for people to uh, typically it's uh, it's it's driven strongly by video games in the gaming industry, but it is being moved farther and farther into the enterprise system, um, uh, especially now with COVID. Uh, people are doing virtual meetings using these VR systems, and it uh, puts you into a virtual workspace where you can work with other people. And there is a lot of work going on in these collaborative environments with people to people. Uh, Facebook, I guess they've changed their name to Meta now and have, have uh, coined this Metaverse term. They are moving very heavily into shared workspaces and facilitating things like uh, we're doing a webinar right now just staring at your computer screen. Uh, maybe in a few years from now, we'll all be putting on VR headsets and we'll be giving these webinars in 3D and, and walking around these virtual environments and showing much more immersive um, types of, uh, types of, of uh, presentations. Um, uh, another big player in the space is Microsoft. They're moving heavily into the virtual reality um, area where they're doing the same thing, trying to create these virtual work workspaces. And NVIDIA is typically a hardware vendor who builds uh, video cards, and they are moving very heavily into developing software and infrastructure systems for this collaborative work environment in what's coined a, a digital twin, which means where you can take your real environments and put them into simulated computer models and do things like optimize, um, optimize processes and optimize logistics uh, items with it. What all of these people are missing and where I think we are coming in uniquely is they are all looking at human to human collaboration. They're looking at collaborative environments with people and workspaces. Uh, we are looking at collaborative uh, environments with people and robots. So that is, that's the, the special sauce I think that sets our focus aside from what some of these big players are doing. Right. And uh, recently there's been widespread adoption, particularly as Facebook uh, has come out with this Oculus Quest, which is a very consumer oriented item, um, hardware, piece of hardware. But they are taking a significant loss on this hardware to try and get uh, several of these out on the market. And they've sold close to 10 million of these units right, right now. Um, to talk about some of the work that we've done in VR, we started several years ago when some of these first enterprise systems were coming out. And we wanted to say, what could we do with virtual reality? One of the first things that we said was, well, we, we develop a lot of equipment in processing plants and we have CAD models of this equipment, but you, it's really hard for you to tell you know, what the implication of that particular piece of equipment is in the environment or what are the ergonomics of that system as you're de developing them. So we demonstrated taking those models and putting them into a virtual reality environment. This is just a, a pre-canned animation here. But uh, we could put on the virtual reality goggles and walk around this equipment in one-to-one -one scale. So you could actually walk up to a piece of equipment, put your hands on it virtually, and see what the ergonomics of it are, or see what the footprint is, or pinch spaces. And when you think about maintenance and, uh, and working on these systems, you could go in uh, into these virtual environments and look at accessibility. So there was a lot of interesting stuff we could do there, but this was also pretty simple. So we took a we took a SolidWorks model, we exported it to a VR environment. You know, anybody can do that. It was it was neat. Um, it was novel at the time, but uh, but but um, not novel enough for us. So I shared the intelligent cutting project, and I wanted to show what we were doing on that because we actually leveraged VR to do a lot of the work with this uh, robotic system. When we talked about the dynamics and those cutting trajectories, we leveraged these virtual reality environments by taking chickens and sneaking in the uh, hospital after hours to go get CAT scans and MRI scans of, of chickens. 
And uh, what you see here in these images are some screen captures that we pulled from those scans. And we were able to import them into virtual environments and then look at a, a simulate a robot application doing the cutting and then take what we learned from these virtual environments and apply it on the actual robot. So it became a tool for us to look at how can we better um, how can we better develop robotics applications? How can we use these novel environments for allowing us to manipulate um, more, more, uh, more rapidly? But also, we could take the same chicken and cut it 100 times, whereas if you have a physical chicken on the line, you cut it once, it's cut, you're done. You've got to have 100 chickens. So this really gave us an environment for, um, for modeling and looking at uh, different, different approaches to the algorithms and evaluating how well those worked. Um, looking at the, uh, the bottom right image here, you see some uh, highlights of the particular tendons that we were looking to separate when you're doing the, that, uh, that wing cut for the deboning operation. And we were able to do a better job of characterizing the cut trajectory of the, uh, of the knives. And given different sizes and varieties of birds, we could model those and look at how it operated on different birds. Here you see a video of just some of that work that you saw in the still pictures earlier. You can see the cut trajectory, the knives pa passing here. Um, you might notice a knife flash red in the simulation. That indicated when the knife hit a piece of bone or when that trajectory was not really good for that particular chicken that we're looking at. In the bottom right is uh, just we were playing around with looking at could you take some modern animation techniques and apply that to chickens in uh, apply it to these real biological scans and make these chickens move and articulate realistically so as you manipulate them in these virtual environments they actually are are uh, they actually move realistically to how it moved we had some success with this but we found there's a there's room for improvement right these systems are made to look good they're not made to be biologically correct necessarily. Um, <clears throat> so now we talk about the most recent work that we've been doing, and this is where we take a culmination of the, the design for robotics and the bringing the virtual environments like the models into, uh, into, virtual, uh, uh, into virtual environments for people to work in. And we said, well, what if we use these environments to allow a person to provide information to a robot? to enable its task. And what we mean here, if you, if you look at this, typically the systems fail, as I mentioned, because they're just not accurate enough in the sensing. When you have a 180 product a minute and you're 90% accurate, you're leaving 18 on the belt uh, every minute, just not, gonna, not, not acceptable. So what if we allowed the human to be the sensor and the decision maker for the robot? Right. And it, there is a big assumption here for some of these particular tasks, and that is that the robot is able to robustly manipulate the product. But if the robot can manipulate robustly, well, then can we allow that human to provide just the information to the robot to enable its task? And this is different from what you might see with some of the shadow robotics and guys that are trying to do these one-to-one -one robot control, like, you know, the, the robot arm is my arm, and as I move it, the robot arm moves. That takes immense processing power and extremely expensive systems and, and implements for doing it. What we're trying to say here is, can we identify the key missing information the robot needs and just give it that information in an intuitive and natural way to allow the robot to do the task. And so for that, we have chosen to look at cone loading. Um, I, I mentioned earlier the end effectors that we're using in the research we've done in that space. And of all the complicated and tricky end effectors that we've developed, um, the, uh, the simple one is the one that we are utilizing now, which is a, a, a cylinder tube with a, a suction end effector that you see in the bottom here. But uh, on a debone line, typically product is loaded at one a second onto that line. Um, it does vary in speed depending on the on the uh, on the company that's running it. But that's a, that's a pretty good ballpark um, timing for it. And the product is presented. It comes in in a bin, like you see in this video that's running here on the top right. Right. Um, and this is these are some of the reasons that we chose this application is because we already have a solution for manipulating it. We've been able to robustly show that with this simple lind effector, we can pick up the front halves and place them on cones. But what we lack is a high, high enough accuracy way of identifying how the orientation of all of those chickens to pick them up out of the bin so that we can appropriately orient the robot to place those chickens on the cone.
To do that, we use some of the 3D sensors I mentioned earlier. You saw that 3D data earlier. So instead of having the 3D data go into a computer algorithm, we take live 3D data and we pipe it into a virtual reality environment. So in the bottom left, you can see a video of the uh, virtual environment piped into a virtual reality system. And this is what a person would be seeing wearing a headset. The controller with the chicken attached to it is um, was some of our early research where we were trying to say, what are some... Um, what are some methods for allowing us to try and define the orientation of a chicken for a robot to then go pick that chicken up? So you see in the uh, illustration here, we scan it physically, we reconstruct it virtually, and the user is able to then operate in that environment and provide that information to the robot. Here is a video of doing a single bin pick that, it, that utilizes the system that we have developed. Uh, that we are still uh, we are still working on uh, on on polishing this system, but we've had some great success with it here. And this environment you see here, this is a view of the of the person wearing the headset. You can see the chicken sitting on a table and a robot on the side. The controller that you see here is moving, um, and they're defining the orientation of that chicken for the robot and Indefector to go and pick that chicken up and place it on a cone. So, as you see the robot moving here. Um, in, in reality, this is also mirrored in virtual reality with the systems that we're doing. And I'll move on to the next slide here. You see a little bit uh, a, a more uh, robust test of this technology where we just took a pile of chicken on a tray. And in the VR system here, you can see, uh, you can see me in the top left um, with, my, with my COVID, COVID hairdo. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> as I as I'm using the virtual environment, the bottom left, you see what I am seeing with the headset. You can see the virtual robot arm moving in synchronization with the actual robot. And the bottom right is a simulation um, that runs on the robot controller that just shows the same. The same information is in the virtual environment, on the robot controller, and then in reality, as you can see it moving here. And you can see in each case, um, what I am doing is defining the orientation of that chicken for the indefector to pick up and cone load for each one. You might notice that it's a little bit slow here, right? This is a, this is a research in progress project as we're working with it. We are working with, um, uh, I would say, research level arms, which are what we call cobots. These are arms that are safe so a person can work in the environment next to them. Um, and if they get hit by the robot, it will stop. But that means it also moves a little bit slower than you might want to see on, on processing or production lines. We're currently working with some robot suppliers to look at getting an uh, industrial spec arm and demonstrate this exact application at line speeds. And for us, what that means is hanging one chicken every, uh, or cone loading one chicken every two seconds with the robot arm, with the concept being that we may have two arms um, for each bin to be able to load at a cycle time of one per second. This moves us out of the realm of safe robots. This moves us into robots that you do not want to have a person around because the accelerations make them dangerous. If you get hit by that robot, it will take your head off. Um, but that is okay because we are enabling the human to work with this robot in a cobot application because they're in a virtual environment in a safe place away from the system, right? And so here you can see these are uh, these are some of the first tests that we've uh, that we've successfully been able to do with this technology, and showing the picking, and we were able to uh, to load all of these birds um, on the cone. Um, as we look to the future and we think about capabilities and things that we can do with this system, um, we have a really interesting twist and in some of the thoughts with this. Right, this one is we looked at this of how can you enable automation. And how can you take uh, these systems that are currently difficult into and close that gap to allow them to, to be successful, right? And we did that by demonstrating a virtual environment with a worker in it. But what, what came out of that is we realized that this really has the potential for a disruptive change to the workforce, right? This enables a new type of worker, right? You're, if you're a virtual worker, we originally envisioned that this might be um, you know, to get the people off of your processing lines, they come in and work 
in your office in an air conditioned room in the virtual environment and do the process. But then we got to thinking, well, why do they even need to be local, right? This this can really distribute the workforce. Um, if you're uh, if you have a car, you can you can log into Uber and you can be a taxi driver for people. So if you have a virtual reality headset, why not be able to log into a uh, a service of some kind and be a virtual worker on a processing line? Or if uh, if if you have a worker calling out sick in one plant, um, why not someone in another another state or another city in one of your other plants fill in virtually to cover that work? So it creates this new flexible workspace, which is very attractive, we think, for, uh, for the industry because it gets people out of the harsh environments, but it also enables a new type of, a, a new type of worker, right? And then uh, you, can, uh, you can crowdsource uh, your work from people who may just have a consumer level gaming headsets now have an opportunity to go work for an hour or two a night and make a few extra bucks, right? All while benefiting the, the processing line, uh, uh, the, the processing plants and the processors, right? One of the other things that I also don't, uh, I should have really focused on here as well is when people are doing this operation and these applications are going, we have sensor data and we have ground truth data. And those are two crucial pieces of information that are used when you are training artificial intelligence systems to treat, to enable robots to do these things autonomously. A challenge right now with AI driven approaches is that you need literally thousands of samples of chickens in different orientations, for example, to train an artificial intelligence engine for a robot to pick it up. If you get systems like this deployed in plants and around the world, you can crowdsource that information and use those to train artificial intelligence operations naturally. And not only can you do that, but you can start, uh, you can start what we call um, uh, uh, partial automation. In other words, as the robot learns how to do the task from people doing it over and over again, it eventually becomes confident enough that it can handle a portion of those tasks. And for the tasks that it cannot handle, it can then dial in a worker and call up a, a virtual worker to fill in the gaps. So in this case, we see one worker not being one-to-one -one with a robot, but you might have one to 10, right? You can have one, one person in a virtual environment running 10 robots that each can run at the 90% efficiency, but the worker filling in that 10% gap at the end. So there is a, a lot of potential and a lot of uh, areas of uh, interesting research to say for this, uh, this type of a system in development. And with that, I think maybe we ended a few minutes early. I can tend to talk fast here, but uh, I think we can uh, open up the uh, floor to questions or anything. I see Doug, you've, you've started your video if you wanted to mention anything or add to that. Thank you, Colin. Great presentation. Appreciate you uh, sharing and um, presenting some of the exciting stuff that we're looking at uh, for virtual reality implementations in the poultry industry and a little bit of the history. If anyone has a question, you can use the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to post your question there. I don't see any at this point in time. Um, Colin, can you tell us maybe while we're waiting for people to formulate questions where you see opportunity for this uh, more broadly and how you think you will be, what are going to be the next steps in terms of pushing this out into a commercial environment? Yep, certainly. Um, I, we, we think that this has some pretty significant potential um, for going into a, a, a lot of different areas, right? You saw here where we are um, controlling a, a robot to pick up and cone load chickens. There are similar applications that could be related to case packing or sorting um, uh, or uh, um, uh, rehang just in poultry processing. But we think there's, there's strong implica implications in all kinds of processing systems where there's harsh environments and you want to get workers out of, the, uh, out of those harsh areas and still be able to have that human decision making or that human intervention going on in, in those manufacturing processes. But it's not just in, in manufacturing. We see, uh, we see opportunity with bringing virtual environments in um, when we talk about agriculture at large, right? Um, uh, when, when you think of agriculture at large, uh, as we bring these sensing ability to say, go out into a, a 
agricultural field of, of crops and scan that into a virtual environment, you can then have an expert visit that environment and make high level decisions um, and even task other robots or mobile systems in that field or just convey information to other people. You think about uh, crop scouting as a big one. <clears throat> Good. So, Colin, can you talk a little bit about what you might see in terms of live operations for poultry and how this might apply? Certainly. Um, some of this work, actually, some of the idea of this work stemmed from a, a, another project that I, that I work on, which is a robot that works in commercial poultry houses. And we demonstrated putting a camera on a robot in one of these houses and streaming the 360 degree video data to a virtual reality headset and allowing a person to, uh, you think of telepresence, but it's almost, I'd say telepresence 2.0 is a person could take over this robot, drive through the environment and look around in a very natural 360 degree way and look at their equipment or look at the chickens um, and virtually visit that house. So we think that there's, uh, you know, uh, aside from just uh, applications of, of doing tasks like these, even simple ones like telepresence, I think, could, could be impactful. And a lot of it is, is um, serving that information in a new way, right, using these virtual environments that allow people to just very naturally see things around them and make decisions or make higher fidelity decisions that they might not get from, say, just looking at a, a laptop monitor with the 2D scene or a standard video feed of something. So Colin, how do you see this changing the labor landscape um, in poultry processing in the long run? Well, we, we hope to see that this can uh, uh, you know, democratize the workforce or open up the, a new type of worker, as I mentioned, right? If we have, uh, um, if you have these interfaces and the ability to control and operate these robot systems um, with these virtual environments, they can be done remotely. So you almost can, uh, you, you not only, uh, you not only enable another type of workforce, but you, you have a 24 seven available workforce now, right? Those workers don't even have to be in your same country. They could be all around the world um, working in your, in your processing uh, facilities. So Colin, I guess my question was more targeted towards what type of person or employee skill set are you gonna require to configure and enable these systems to operate in processing plants? I see what I see. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that is an interesting one, right? As you look at putting uh, robots in processing lines, that's going to shift your need from your, your standard, you know, welding and engineers and, and, and people in that you you will probably need some uh, robotics, uh, robotics capabilities for your engineers in the plant to be able to operate these systems. Um, and there's also the challenge of, and this is, this is still a true challenge when you look at automation of these systems is, well, what, what happens if one of these systems do break down, right? What, what do you do? How do you, how do you continue processing if your robot has stopped moving? And I think those are still challenges that we need to address and look at. <clears throat> are you concerned at all about the robustness of the hardware that would go into a processing facility when you're talking about robotics and things like this? And how do you address those concerns? Um, so robotics in a lot of the processing plants, as I mentioned, are in packaging in areas where they're typically dry, <laughs> right? When you talk about on processing land, um, lines, these are very wet environments. And I think we're seeing several robotics companies come to the front with these um, wash down capable robots and wet and harsh environment capable robots. So I'm, I'm, if you asked me this two years ago, I would be inclined to say I'm pretty concerned with the state of, of of robots in these facilities, but I think that we see more and more as, as the companies target these facilities, they're developing capable robot systems for operating in these environments. And we, we are working with some, uh, with some companies right now to try and do, I think you, you, I, I forgot to answer half of your earlier question is, um, you know, what are we doing to try and make this not a research project and an actual commercially viable system? So we are looking into uh, a, a harsh environment robot arm capable of operating at line speeds and to translate this research into a demonstrable prototype that we can go stick on a processing line and, and show in a processing plant. Good, if you have any further questions, feel free to put those in the Q&A um, at the bottom of the screen. You can click that little button and add your question there. Um, 
Colin, I'm not seeing any other questions come up at this point in time. Are there any other comments that you'd like to, uh, to provide or leave? Um, I guess I'd, I'd like to say, uh, I'd, I'd like to thank the uh, Poultry Science Association for the opportunity to uh, do the webinar. As I mentioned, I always enjoy, I always enjoy uh, talking at these things, and uh, it's always fun to uh, get input and insight. And every time we present something, uh, we learn something new ourselves. So, uh, I, you know, thank everybody for listening. And, and I'm just hoping, since we don't have any good questions, that I just did that great a job. <laughs> Well, we appreciate you taking the time, Colin, to share this with us, and um, we look forward to uh, learning more about what you're doing and the work that you're pursuing um, in terms of virtual reality systems for poultry processing. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, Colin's left his contact information here on the screen. Feel free to take a quick screen cap of that, and feel free to reach out to him directly if you have any other follow-on questions. Um, Otherwise, we encourage you to stay tuned, be ready and listening and waiting for the next Poultry Science Association webinar. And we want to thank uh, Poultry Science for allowing us to uh, have this opportunity. So thank you for participating and we wish you all a great rest of your day. Thank you.